and now Saul is dead. Ziklag is destroyed. There, there's nothing there for him now. You know, once you burn that bridge, you can't go back across it. There's nothing there for him. He wants to go home. But is it the right time? Will they welcome me? What if they're mad at me because I left? <laughs> is there a place for me? So let's start in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? He said, To Hebron. So David went up there and his two wives, Anahom the Jezreelites, Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household. So they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. You know, David's strength, you know, he had strengthened himself in the Lord. He was back in relationship with the Lord. And so the first thing he did before he did anything, he inquired of the Lord. He inquired before he took action. That is a very basic principle that we all need to remember, remember is to inquire before action. Not action and then inquire, what do I do now? Because then you've already messed up the situation. <laughs> okay? It's better to do it, ahead, do it up front than to try to fix something after the fact. Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? Why Judah? Why does he say Judah? Why doesn't he say the northern part of Israel where the king was? Why does he say Judah? But why was it in Judah? Because it was home. Judah was home. He was from Bethlehem in Judah. Judah was home. He wanted to go home. You know, Hebron, Hebron is significant in its location. You know, when Abraham... Um, there's a couple scriptures here about Hebron. On the next slide. Uh, and Hebron was the where Abram and Lot parted. When when Abram and Lot parted ways, Abram moved to Hebron. That's um, also where Sarah died. Genesis 13:18 says, "And Abram moved his tent and went and dealt, dwelt by the terebinth trees of Marm, where which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord." And then. Genesis 23 2. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, the land of Canaan, and Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. It's also the land that Caleb inherited when they divided up Israel. And remember, he, because he and Joshua were the two that obeyed God, um, Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of, of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. So Hebron was also a significant place in Bible history. So it was, one, it was um, also one of the places that, remember when we talked about when, he, when David and his men went and rescued the family that had been kidnapped by the Amalekites when they destroyed Ziklag. He came back with a huge spoil, just, you know, got back everything they had, plus a whole bunch more stuff. And he sent to um, some of the cities in Judah a portion of that spoil, and Hebron was one of them. So David and his two wives and all his men and all their households, meaning their wives, their children, um, moved into the area of Hebron, into the cities there. Now notice at this time... It mentions David's family, and what's it made up of? Two wives. No children. No children. During his time in Ziklag, it was a dry time for David. He didn't write any psalms, any poems, any songs, and he didn't have children. He didn't bear any fruit because he was out of the will of God. He was not where he should have been. Okay, so he had not been fruitful during this time. Okay, 2 Samuel 4. Then the men of Judah came 
And there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David and his men, they move to Hebron, and they settle in, and they're just living their lives. Okay? The men of Judah, they come to David. And, you know, it's been probably, I think I read it, like it's been between 15 and 20 years since David was first anointed king by Samuel. So it had been a long time. And, uh, but at the time that he was anointed, it wasn't, he wasn't ready to be king. He wasn't ready to be king. He had to go through training. He had to go through trials. He had to go through these pressings to make him into a man who could be king, to reveal his character, that molding and making process that we all know is so difficult, that we all go through. Um, and, but he didn't go in and seize the role of king. You know, he didn't go in there and take it by will or by force, by saying, I am David. Give me the, you know, the throne. I'm taking it. It's mine. He didn't do that. He moved in, and they settled in. And then the men, they came to him. Um, so they made him king over Judah. Now, granted, it's just over the house of Judah. He's not king of all Israel yet. He's just king over the house of Judah. But it was a start on the path that he's destined for. You know, we get a little bit at a time. And, you know, responsibilities. And once we're able to handle those responsibilities, then we get more responsibilities. Okay. I like this quote. It said, David knew that it was better to let God lift you up through, the one, through, through others than to strive to advance your, yourself. We should strive to advance God's kingdom and leave the advancement of self in his hands. You know, that seek first the kingdom of God. <laughs> All these other things will be added on to you, added to you. So David received this fresh anointing as king over Judah. Um, that couldn't happen while he was still in Ziklag. Couldn't happen there. It had to be, you know, where he was back home, where he belonged. And he had to step back and he had to get into the will of God. And you know just the way it happened. They, you know, they came to him and they anointed him to king. When, when it happens that way and it just feels so natural, it feels organic, it feels authentic, it's the way it's supposed to be. That's, you, know, you, you have that, that feeling of peace when you know that something's right, that, it, that this is something that God has, has laid out. You, you get that, that feeling that you know. You know that you know. 2 Samuel 5-7 through seven. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown his kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you with this kindness, because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strengthened and be valiant, for your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah has anointed king over, over them. Let's look at the next slide as a map. Now you see up there in the upper right-hand corner, the red, that's where Jabesh Gilead is. Down at the bottom, um, one of the last cities down at the bottom, if you can read it, is Jerusalem. Hebron is south of Jerusalem, so you see the distance that someone had to carry that message. Um, we talked about, um, when we talked about the death of Saul, we talked about how the men of Jabesh Gilead, they did go out at night and they... they crossed the river over to Beth Shan and they rescued the bodies of Saul and his sons and brought them home and gave them a proper burial. It was important for David to recognize them, to thank them for what they did. Look at this location. These were brave and valiant men who would one day make excellent um, servants and allies down the road as he worked toward his goal of becoming Israel. A king of Israel. Okay, so you can imagine um, because there did ensue a war between the house of Saul and the house of David. So you can imagine in that kind of a situation to have that kind of a friend that strategically positioned, he wanted to make sure they had a good relationship. Okay, because you remember the kings were, they were kings, but they were also the heads of their military. So he's thinking strategically here. But he did want to honor them for what they did for Saul. Um, it's 
so there was a war that arose between the house of Saul and the house of David later on in verse 11 it says that David was king in Hebron over the house of Israel for seven and a half years so you know this the, you know things don't happen overnight we sometimes we we feel like well this is what God's called me to do and we think okay let's do it and God's like mm -mm, there's still there you forgot there's another round of training now you have to go through and so sometimes it takes a little longer to get where you think that you're going and sometimes you end up someplace you didn't think you were going you know you just got to be ready to go along for the ride so during this time he is um, king over Judah meanwhile what's happening back in Israel is Abner who was the commander of Saul's army you know of course they're con they're still in battle with the Philistines there's a lot of turmoil going on but at some point he um, takes Saul's son Ishbosheth and he puts him in as the king okay because you remember many of Saul's sons died with him in that battle Jonathan was the the heir next in line but there were other sons um, I don't remember it was two or three that also died in battle with him so Ishbosheth was 40 years old when he became king so he was the second king of Israel <laughs> and but he said he only reigned for two years. David was in Judah for seven and a half, but Ishbosheth only served for two. So it was probably not right away that he became, became the king. But look at what happens during this time of this war. And we find this in 2 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 5. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker sons were born to David in Hebron his first was Am Amnon by Anahom the Jezreelitess the second was Chiliab by Abigail the son of Nabal the Carmelite the third Absalom the son of, of, of Maka the daughter of Talmai the king of Geshur the fourth um, Ad Adonijah the son of Haggith the fifth Shep the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrim, by David's wife, Eglah. These were born to David in Hebron. So what's, what's happening to David now that he has come home, that he has taken his place where he's supposed to be as the anointed king? He's growing. We can look at our lives and see if we're growing or we're stagnant and kind of assess where we are in our walk with God. David is growing. He's getting stronger. He is bearing fruit. He's having sons. Now he's going to have a lot more. This is just, he's just getting started, okay? But he's growing. God has restored him. God has blessed him. He didn't just survive that time in Ziklag. He is now thriving. And later, after Ishbosheth was murdered, as well as Abner, now Israel comes to David, and they want to make him their king. 2 Samuel 5, verses 1 through 5. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are, bone, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people my people Israel be ruler over Israel therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel David was 30 years old when he began to reign and reigned 40 years in Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah so now it's finally all come together and they say we are your your bone and your flesh we are your family he has come home to his family the family is finally all back together and they acknowledge yeah you know you were the one that led us in and out and you were the one that Lord said would shepherd us and would be rule over us and so now they have come to that conclusion and and they came to him again he did not have to go in and take it by force he didn't have to kill anybody for it he took God as the one that promoted him 
that's the best way to get promoted is to let God do it and not to force it on your own of course now sometimes not all the family is as quick to welcome you back as others sometimes they need to watch you they want to observe you to see whether you they can trust you with their heart again it's hard sometimes to trust someone with your heart again after they've broken up but do not harden your hearts toward them instead choose to love them and live your life before them and let God bring you together um, there's a quote that says having somewhere to go is home having someone to love is family having both is a blessing truly next week is Thanksgiving um, I want to remind everybody that we won't have service Wednesday night a lot of people are traveling well <laughs> the prodigal son returns <laughs> you feel more like Lazarus I get that <laughs> Um, many traveling to see family or expecting family to visit. There's meal prep time. It's a time to honor family. You know, Thanksgiving is a lot of things to a lot of people, but I think for most people it's about family. If there's any estrangement among your family, this would be a really good time to acknowledge that, to recognize that, to reach out for reconciliation, to reunite. But inquire of God first. Inquire of God first before you act. God, do I invite this family member that's been estranged, that's been away from, do I invite them to my home? Ask God first. Do I go to someone? Ask God first. But I think, it, you know, it's always God's will that family love each other, that family be together that we support each other. But sometimes there are things that get in the way. And if God tells you, yes, then act. Be the brave one that can take that first step. Is rejection a possibility? When you love, it always is. It always is. Because we're dealing with people. And sometimes people do disappoint us. Sometimes we set our expectations too high. Perhaps your separation hasn't been with your natural family, but with God. He will never disappoint. Just like the father in the story of the prodigal son, he is waiting, he is watching for you to come home. The door is always open. The only question you have to ask is, Lord, can you please forgive me? I want to come home. It is well, it is his will that none would perish and all would come to repentance. So yes, he wants you to come home. And this is a message I think that we need to share with our family. He wants you to come home. As a church family, we should reflect that same love. We should create an atmosphere here of love, of acceptance, of welcome for sinners for backsliders, for those that are just trying to figure it out. This should be a safe place to seek God's presence and to worship. Are we still going to have some of those fleshly responses to people sometimes? <laughs> sure. Like I said, quit rolling those eyes. <laughs> um, but don't we also even have that even with our closest family members? We get aggravated with each other. It's the love that overrides that. As I was doing this lesson, I just felt there are some homecomings coming our way, either in our own families or here in our church. And you need to be in line with God and inquiring of him before you act, but be willing to act when he tells you. And I, I really do feel like this is a message for someone. 
that it's time to really come home, to really commit your life to God. And if God is calling you back, not only to him, but to this body, then come. We are here, and we will love you. That's all I have. I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Anybody have any comments? Does anybody need anything? The altars are always open, and we're always here to pray. It's 1033, so you have a little...